Well, good morning and welcome. And uh, again, as I ordinarily say, I trust the Lord will bless you uh, for joining with us today. We're going to make a little start and we're going to sing our first hymn this morning, number 34 in Songs of Victory. Uh, We'll stand to sing and uh, I trust others will join with us uh, as uh, we sing our first hymn this morning. Number 34, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. unite together for a little word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we bow before you, uh, we want to thank you again, uh, Lord, for this reminder, even of the love of Jesus, uh, Lord, for our souls. We thank you for your great love. Uh, wherewith you have loved us. Indeed, we thank you that it is an everlasting love and that, Lord, you have shown how much uh, you loved us even in sending your only begotten Son, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, into this world uh, to die on a cross even for the sins of the world. Uh, We thank you Uh, Lord Jesus, that uh, you came, indeed, uh, that you uh, endured the cross, uh, even for sinners uh, such as uh, ourselves here. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took our sin and you bore our sin, even there in your own body on the tree. We thank you, Lord Jesus, Uh, that you paid for it in full. We thank you, Lord, that uh, our sins uh, have been remitted. Uh, Our sins uh, have been forgiven. Indeed, we thank you uh, that our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Indeed, we are thankful that our sins, uh, Lord, which were many, Uh, that they have been cast over your back, 
and into the depths of the sea, uh, never to be remembered uh, against us again. Indeed, we thank you that we can say there is now, therefore, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, uh, that we are new creatures in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we have passed from death uh, unto life. Indeed, we thank you that our names, Lord, are written uh, in the Lamb's book of life. We thank you for the assurance of that. We thank you, Lord, for the witness uh, of your Holy Spirit. Indeed, we thank you for the promise of the Father. We thank you, Lord, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Indeed, we thank you, uh, Lord, that, uh, that we are yours. Uh, and we can say uh, confidently that your banner over us is love. Indeed, you care for our soul. And not only for our soul, but, uh, Lord, you care for every aspect of life. Indeed, uh, we thank you uh, that uh, we have a, a loving, heavenly Father who is able to meet all of our needs. Indeed, one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And we pray, Lord, that even today uh, in this house, that if there be any, Lord, that the Lord may be anxious, uh, Lord may be fearful, uh, Lord may be carrying a burden of any sort, that, Lord, you might draw nigh even unto them today, and that, Lord, you might cheer their heart, you might reassure them, uh, that, Lord, you might comfort them, that, Lord, you might indeed uh, go with them, strengthen them, Lord, whatever the need may be. Indeed, we think of those, Lord, that can't be with us today, uh, and uh, we do indeed pray that you will remember uh, each one. We think again of Alistair here, and Lord, you know his frame. You know, Lord, what has happened to him in recent weeks. And we pray that, Father, having been laid aside, that he might know the healing power of an almighty God. And that, Lord, you would restore him to health and strength. And that, Lord, he might again be able to join with us here. Uh, Father, uh, when we meet uh, to worship God, uh, when we meet to sit under your word, even, Lord, when we meet to uh, remember our Lord's death uh, till he comes. Indeed, we think of others, Lord, as well. We think of uh, Billy and uh, Marion here. And, Lord, we know they're no longer able to be with us, uh, at least on a, on a regular basis. And again, Father, you know why. And we pray that uh, you will bless them, uh, Lord, even in their own homes today. Remember Isabel as well. And Father, you know the situation there, and we pray that she might also be a partaker of the blessings of God. Lord, we commit this hour to you. We pray uh, that we will be conscious of your presence. We pray that, Father, we will know that God is in the midst. We pray that you might speak through your word, that, Lord, you would give us understanding that, Father, you would indeed help us to comprehend these things, even these unfathomable things, these things, Lord, that uh, seem almost uh, inconceivable and unbelievable. Father, we pray uh, that we might understand and that, Lord, we might also see uh, that uh, he, uh, Lord, who is the God of this world, that, Lord, uh, the lake of fire, uh, will be his portion uh, for eternity. And not only his, but Lord, his angels, and uh, Lord, every wicked and foul and evil spirit. And Lord, unfortunately, we know, even uh, for those who have not believed on him whom you have sent. So, Father, I pray for your help. I ask that you will undertake for me here, uh, Lord, as I would open your word in a little while. And uh, Lord, again, I pray for your blessing upon us uh, as we would seek to worship you. Undertake for Anne as she plays for us. Lord, help us to sing out, to sing praises unto God. Let our worship be pleasing unto you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again. Uh, we're going to turn to... 
number 61. Number 61, this time in Redemption Hymnal. Number 61. And I will stand to sing, please. I need the precious Saviour. lovely to have you with us this morning and as I've already said I trust uh, the Lord will bless you. Uh, come back this evening if you're free uh, for our gospel service at 6.30 uh, p.m. We're going to sing our third hymn, number eight in Redemption Hymnal. Number eight, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And again we'll stand to sing please.
So whatever you're feeling most comfortable with, then that's the way you can sing it here this morning, because I know we're not a big congregation, and uh, some of the ladies might not want to sing out just as loudly as the men. So we'll try that again. We'll go on to first two here, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. We'll sing it the other way, will we? (laughs) We'll just sing it the way, as a congregation then, rather than man taking a part there. your Bibles with you. We're turning again to the book of Revelation and chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to read the first 10 verses again. Uh, We looked uh, specifically at the first six, and so we're going to look at the last four in this passage, seven through to ten, but we're going to read the first ten verses. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, And shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. 
And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the sea in Sabite, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and defied them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever ending our reading there. Let's just bow together for a short word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this time together this morning, uh, for these hymns that we've sung, and Lord, for the opportunity now to consider your word. And we thank you again for your word, and we thank you that it is truth. We thank you, Lord, uh, that it has been established in the heavens, and not one jot or tittle of it shall fail. Indeed, we thank you for this specific book that we've been looking at, uh, the book of Revelation. And Lord, we've been going through it, we might almost say with a fine tooth comb. Uh, We've been looking at it in depth. Uh, Lord, we have uh, learned many things. We have considered many things, deep things. And Lord, we pray uh, even here this morning as we would seek to consider uh, these particular verses, uh, that the Holy Spirit uh, would indeed give us understanding, that he would help us to comprehend these things. Uh, And Lord, uh, when we consider even the fate of our enemy here, uh, there would indeed be rejoicing in our heart, knowing that uh, he, uh, Lord, that old, that red dragon, that old serpent, Lord, the devil, Satan, uh, will once and for all, uh, Lord, be consigned uh, even to the lake of fire, uh, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. So, Lord, I pray for your help. I ask for the enablement of your Holy Spirit. Indeed, I pray that you will minister to our hearts, that you will speak to us, that we'll be conscious of your presence. Lord, we look to you. I place myself into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week in our study here in the book of Revelation, uh, we began to look at the coming earthly kingdom uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, as we did so, of course, we, uh, we uh, restrained ourselves, our wrong word, constrained ourselves to the passage in particular, uh, for there are many things that can be said about his coming kingdom. Uh, there are many passages in the Old Testament uh, that tell us many wonderful things about his coming kingdom, but we, we've, we've stuck with the passage and uh, in doing so, we thought about two particular prophecies. First of all, we had a prophecy involving Satan in verses 1 to 3. And then we looked at a second prophecy, a prophecy involving saints in verses 4 to 6. And with regards to this prophecy involving Satan, uh, we thought about a heavenly intervention. And as we did so, we considered the assignment and the authority of the angel of God. 
uh, an angel was sent from heaven uh, to imprison Satan in the bottomless pit in the abyss for one thousand years. And we see that he was given authority because he was given the key to the bottomless pit. We also considered in regards to this particular prophecy uh, the uh, power and personality of the arch enemy of God. We thought about his power and how it took a great chain to bind him, uh, to uh, indeed keep him there. Uh, something akin to the everlasting chains that are used uh, to imprison those, those uh, fallen angels that left their first estate that we read about in Genesis chapter 6. And we thought about his personality and how it is given to us here, even in these names that are, that are given to him. This red dragon, that old serpent, the devil and Satan. And we also thought about a heavenly incarceration. And as we did so, we thought about the place and the purpose and the period of Satan's incarceration. He was imprisoned in the bottomless pit. And uh, he was imprisoned there in order to stop him from deceiving the nations during the millennial reign of Christ. And he was uh, imprisoned for a specific period of time. 1,000 years being the length of our Lord Jesus Christ's uh, reign, his future reign here on earth. Then regarding the prophecy involving saints, we looked at how living saints will be received. And I told you there last week that there will be those who will be saved during the tribulation and who will survive the tribulation. And when Jesus comes uh, to, to, to judge and to wage war, they will be received into the kingdom. They will enter into the kingdom in their natural bodies and they will have children and they will repopulate the earth. And then we thought about how dead saints will be resurrected. How when Jesus comes back, those who, those who died in faith will be raised. Of course, prior to that, uh, prior to that peer or to that particular, uh, event, we, we, uh, I pointed out at the rapture. Um, the church will be raptured uh, and those who are dead in Christ will be raised at the rapture and shall precede us and shall meet the Lord in the air and then we which are alive and remain shall join with them as well. But we also thought how those who will be martyred for their faith to the tribulation, in the tribulation, they will be raised from the dead at the end of the tribulation and likewise so will the old Testament saints. The dead will be raised. And when they are raised from the dead, they will receive glorified bodies like unto his glorious body. And then I also told you about how glorified saints will reign. Those who have been raised from the dead, those who are going to be given glorified bodies, they are going to be in the kingdom, but they're going to rule and they're going to reign with our Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to bring about his purposes on earth. They're going to reign as vice regents of the king. Well, this morning... We're going to consider a third prophecy that we see here concerning the coming earthly kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to consider a prophecy involving sinners. A prophecy involving sinners as detailed here in verses 7 through to 10. Now as we consider this prophecy, there's three main things I want to share with you. And for those of you who are taking notes, they're quite simple. We have Satan's freedom, Satan's forces, and Satan's fate. So we begin with Satan's freedom. And there are three questions I want to answer here as we think about his freedom. Why? How? 
or should I begin even when, how, and perhaps more importantly than anything else, why? As we consider then the when, John was told that Satan would be loosed out of his prison when the thousand years are expired. To put that another way, the arch enemy of God, whose name Satan means ad for sorry, he will be loosed from the abyss. He will be released from the bottomless pit towards the end of the millennial reign of Christ to orchestrate one final revolt, one final revolt against the Lord and his anointed. In fact, he will be released towards the end of that promised period of peace and prosperity to deceive the nations into thinking that they can overthrow King Jesus. So that's the the when. It's going to happen at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. That's what it says. It's in black and white. It's in your Bible. But how? Well, I would like to be able to give you a definitive uh, explanation. But unfortunately, all we are told is that in verse 7, he shall be loosed out of his prison toward the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Now that said, I think it's important to understand it's not going to be a jailbreak. Okay, it's not going to be a jailbreak. It won't be the result of of some ingenious plan of Satan while he's in prison for a thousand years. He's not going to be able to work out a way to get out of this prison. Nor is it going to be the result of some malevolent spirit, some evil spirit outside of the prison. Because they're going to be in the prison with him. So it's neither going to be an ingenious plan of Satan, nor is it going to be the result of some work of an evil spirit. He will be released from the prison toward the end of this period of time in accordance with the will of God. In accordance with the will of Almighty God. Now it may be, and we're not told, it may be that the same angel that incarcerated him, the same angel that put him into the bottomless pit, the same angel that bound him with the chain, the same angel that that closed the, the, the bottomless pit and locked the bottomless pit, it may be that as he is directed by the Lord, he is the one who will release him. For after all, he has the key of the bottomless pit. It was given to him to lock him up. We don't know, but he is going to be released because it is the will of God. And so that takes us to the third question and perhaps the most important question. Why? Why? Well, verse 3 here tells us he must, he must be loosed a little season. There's a purpose. He must be uh, loosed a little season. He must be released from his prison for a short period of time to lead all the Christ-rejecting sinners born in the millennial kingdom into one final rebellion against God and his Christ. So that God, when he destroys them, no one will be able to decry what God does. 
No one will be able to point the finger at what God does because when God judges these uh, Christ-rejecting sinners, it will be understood by all that God has acted in justice. God has done so manifestly, righteously. Indeed, he will be released from his prison for a short period of time to reveal. Reveal what can only be described as the latent rebellion. The latent rebellion in the heart of man. Those that are born in the millennium who have never truly trusted in Christ as their Savior King. For he will bring them all together. This is Satan now. He will bring them all together in one last ditched attempt to conquer Satan, or to conquer Christ, sorry. That the thousand years that Satan is in prison doesn't change him. He still has a purpose in mind. He wants to conquer Christ. But in the end, in the end it will come to naught, for as we shall see, God will justly destroy them all. For he will consume these Christ rejectors with fire from heaven. And he will consign Satan to the lake of fire. You know, it's, it's truly unbelievable to think that those born during the millennial or millennium, that they will, many of them will rebel. Many of them will rebel against the rule and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to imagine that, isn't it? Oh, we can understand it in this world. People don't want Jesus to rule over them. But when Christ comes and sets up his kingdom, there will be those who will be born in the kingdom. And they will reject Christ. And it clearly demonstrates what we read here, the depravity of man. It clearly demonstrates the depravity of man. For it shows us that nothing can change the heart of man. Not even a perfect environment. And it's going to be a perfect environment. The Old Testament makes that clear. People are going to live older. The earth is going to be restored to Eden-like conditions. And yet there are people still going to reject Christ. His rule over them. And of course the only thing that can change the heart of man is the grace of God. And so you can't blame the environment in which you grew up in. For making you the sinner that you are. Or it might contribute to it. But the sinner that we are is not down to our environment, it's down to the condition of our heart. Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Now thankfully many of the descendants of those tribulation saints who who enter the kingdom, who have the joy of entering the kingdom alive in their natural bodies, they will be saved. There will be many who will be saved over that thousand year period. But there will be others who will never trust in him. In fact, they, they will outwardly, outwardly conform to his rule and reign. They may even pledge allegiance to him. But inwardly, inwardly their hearts will remain remain unchanged. Just like every, every other sinner in every other age. These people will love sin rather than Christ. And so, the reason that he will be loosed 
is to lead a revolt. Is to, 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 to bring together the peoples of the world. Those who have never received Christ, even in the millennium. Never trusted in him as their saviour. It is to lead them in rebellion against God. So that when God destroys them, he will reveal what sort of people they were. They looked okay. They looked like those who, 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 who feared him. But inside their hearts were wicked and rebellious. And so we come to Satan's forces. And there are three little thoughts I want to leave with you as we think about Satan's forces. First of all, their delusion. John tells us that when Satan is released... He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. If we were to put that another way, when Satan is released from the abyss, he will somehow, he will somehow convince an innumerable company of Christ-rejecting sinners from all over the world who know the power of Jesus, who, who, who know uh, the might of Jesus, who know the character of Jesus. Somehow he will, he will convince these people to, to take up arms, to take up arms against him. In the belief, in the belief that they can actually overthrow Jesus Christ, their rightful king. And of course we shouldn't be surprised at Satan's ability to do so. For he was able to convince the kings of the earth and of the whole world in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14 there. He was able to convince the kings the kings of the earth and of the whole world, into thinking that they could defeat the Lord Jesus Christ at the battle of Armageddon. And we looked at that a good few weeks ago. And how did he do it on that occasion? By working miracles among them. Somehow he deceived these kings into thinking they could defeat Jesus. I don't know what he's going to do here when this happens, but somehow he's going to deceive them. They're going to be deluded into thinking they can conquer Jesus. So that's their delusion. And then we have their designation. When Satan rounds up his forces... They are going to march under the title of Gog and Magog. Now, Gog is a, is a proper name. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 4, there's someone there called Gog. But it has become a, a general title for an enemy of God's people. And uh, Magog is, the, is the, the name of a land north of Israel. A people or a nation, if you prefer, founded by and called after one of Noah's grandsons. So one of Noah's grandsons was called Magog, and he founded this land, this nation north of Israel. And Gog here, as I said, is a proper name of someone in the Bible, but it has also become a general title for one of the enemies, or for an enemy, I should say, of God's people. Now, it is thought that this title is used here because this great army, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, think about that. 
Here are people living in a perfect environment. Jesus is ruling and reigning. There is perfect justice being executed. And yet at the very end, there will be perhaps millions, who knows how many, who will rebel against Jesus. And the thinking here is that this title may be used because when this army comes against the Lord, it comes in the same spirit of antagonism against Israel that is found in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, where we read about another battle involving Gog and Magog. And in recent weeks and months, there have been people who have been preaching upon those two chapters because they're thinking about Russia and how Russia has come into the Ukraine. And they're, they're identifying Russia, of course, with Gog and Magog. Now, there are different opinions on that. But it seems here that, that this army is given this title because they are antagonistic against Israel. They are antagonistic against the people of God. They are antagonistic toward Christ. And then we have their destruction. John tells us here that this great army went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and defied them. Again, if we were to put that another way, this great army came up over the breadth of a, a reconfigured earth. Remember in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 20, there was a great earthquake. And what happened? The mountains were leveled and the islands disappeared. So the earth has been reconfigured and this army is coming up on the breadth of a reconfigured earth and, and they are surrounding the encampment, the encampment of the saints and the city of Jerusalem to make war against the redeemed and their redeemer against the saved and their saviour, only to be utterly destroyed by fire from heaven. In fact, it seems to me that the saints will rally around their saviour king at Jerusalem in preparation for this battle if they're not already living there. Now, it may well be that many of the saints are going to move to that general area of the world to be nearer to their Savior, to be nearer to their King. But it also seems here, because the word for camp here, um, it means battle array. It means encampment or barracks. And so it may well be that, that those who are saved, those who are, who love the Lord, that they're gathering uh, around Jerusalem, they're gathering in the, the, the promised land, ready for this battle, uh, as, as the nations of the earth are coming against Jerusalem and against Christ. But they won't need to fight. They won't need to fight against these Christ-rejecting sinners whom Satan is able to deceive into thinking that they can overthrow their rightful king for God himself. God himself will deal with them. It was like that at the Battle of Armageddon, remember? The saints didn't need to fight. Jesus came and spoke. And he he killed his enemies with a word. And here we see in this event a thousand years later, God himself will deal with these Christ-rejecting sinners by sending fire from heaven. And they will be totally and utterly consumed by this fire from heaven. And remember, fire from heaven uh, is a means of divine judgment in the Bible. 
Of course, the classic example is, is that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire came down from heaven and destroyed those cities when God judged them for their sins. Then you think of, of uh, Elijah and how fire came down from heaven on, on three different occasions to, to, to kill different captains and, and, and their soldiers. Then you think of some of his disciples and how they said, Lord, will you not call down fire from heaven? Fire from heaven is a means of divine judgment. And here, God is going to act and God is going to intervene and God is going to consume totally, utterly the physical bodies of these Christ rejectors. And of course then their souls, their souls will just drop off into hell to await judgment at the great white throne which we'll be thinking about next week. And then let me finish, and I'll try and be quick. We have Satan's fate. Three very short, simple things. First of all, his consignment. Immediately following the destruction of Satan's forces, John tells us that the devil in verse 10 that deceived him was cast into the lake of fire. That is, he was unceremoniously thrown into God's final form of hell from which there is no escape. He was released from the bottomless pit. But when he is thrown into the lake of fire, He will never get out. He will never get out. In fact, he was thrown into everlasting fire, as Jesus refers to it in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. A place of eternal punishment that was prepared by God. Now, we're not told when, but God has prepared a place for whom? The devil and his angels. And so he is cast into this place that God has prepared for him. God is in control. And God will bring everything to pass that we read about in Scripture. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. And then we have his cronies. When Satan is cast into the lake of fire, he will join his cronies. Who are his cronies? Verse 10, the beast and the false prophet. Who are still in that place of torment after 1,000 years. Remember these two satanically empowered servants of Satan. They were taken by alive. They were taken alive by our Lord Jesus Christ at the battle of Armageddon. And they were thrown straight into the lake of fire. We see that in chapter 19 and verse 20. In fact, they became the first. They became the first of many who will be thrown into that place of torment. But for 1,000 years, for 1,000 years, they will suffer the anguish of hell fire all alone. Just the two of them. For 1,000 years until Satan joins them at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. And as we'll see next week, many more will join with them as well. Let me just say that their presence there, after 1,000 years, disproves the doctrine of annihilation. The teaching that the wicked will cease to exist after their death. There are people who believe that. That once you die, you're gone. That's it. No more. Nothing to worry about. They deny the doctrine of eternal punishment. There are those who teach annihilation, but these words tell us that their teaching is false. For these wicked men, the beast and the false prophet, are very much alive. 
They're very much alive in the lake of fire. Even after a millennium, a thousand years of untold suffering. And so we have his consignment. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire and he's going to be there forever. We have his cronies, the beast and the false prophet that have been there for a thousand years already. And then we have his castigation. And with this I finish. Like his cronies, the beast and the false prophet, Satan, we're told in verse 10, will be tormented day and night forever and ever. In fact, this fallen angel, this fallen angel and all who follow him there, and there is going to be multitudes, multitudes who will follow him there. Christ rejecting sinners in every generation. This fallen angel will experience unrelieved torment throughout eternity. There's not going to be one moment. There's not going to be one moment where he does not suffer. It's not going to be relieved at any time. It's going to be continuous, ongoing, eternal. It will last forever. And let me just conclude by saying that this statement, and shall be tormented day and night forever, also disproves the doctrine of annihilation. For sinners will pay the price for their sin in God's final form of hell, the lake of fire. It substantiates, it proves the biblical doctrine of eternal punishment. But Christ died to save us from our sins. Christ died to save us from hell. Christ died to save us from the second death, from the lake of fire. He paid the price for our sin on the cross at Calvary. But if you reject him, like the beast and the false prophet, like Satan and his demonic horde, you too will pay the price for your sin in this place that was prepared not for you, but for the devil and his angels. And so there's no time if you've never done it before. There's no time like today, no time like now to come and to put your faith in him, to trust in him. Will you come? Come just as you are. He'll clean you up. He'll sort you out. He'll forgive you. He'll receive you just as you are but come. Well, we're going to sing our closing hymn. 326 in Redemption Hymnal. 326, Jesus the name high over all in hell or earth or sky.
Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your presence among us this morning and again for your speaking voice. And Lord, whilst we cannot fathom uh, what those born in the millennium, uh, how they will, how many of them will reject Christ, how they will even be deluded uh, to come against Christ. We know that it's going to happen. You've said it in your word. And Lord, not only that, we know that Satan is uh, going to get his just desserts, so to speak. One day, uh, Lord, he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And he, Lord, with all who follow him, uh, Lord, are going to uh, be cast in there with him. They're going to suffer eternally. Uh, Lord, they're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And Lord, I pray that if there's any here this morning who has not yet come to Christ, who has not yet trusted in him, that, Lord, they might make it the desire of their soul, the, the priority even of this moment, to get right with God. In Jesus' name, amen.